Welcome back to America's Forum. We've been talking about it already, and we're going to talk about it again. He was sent on a mission to attack our military. Thankfully, now he's behind bars. An Ohio man facing charges for allegedly plotting a terror attack here against U.S. soldiers after getting weapons and terror training in Syria. Joining us now with more on this developing story, National Security Analyst Ryan Morrow Skyping in from New Jersey. And for the rest of the hour, my good friend who does the right thinking as a Newsmax contributor from the left coast at Newsmax LA, it's Larry Elder. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And Ryan, let's start with this curious case. Uh, how did this guy end up on the Fed's radar screen? Well, what's really interesting about this is that his brother was a member of al-Qaeda in Syria and was killed there, which is actually a kind of a common pattern that we see with this, where radicalization happens because there's someone very close in your social circle, a family member, a close friend, a mentor, who radicalizes you. And so it's, a, it's somewhat of a personal process, this radicalization. Uh, but there's a few different takeaways that are really important here. Uh, what we see is that his brother supported al-Qaeda, but this individual supported ISIS, um, although he may have joined al-Qaeda once he was there because he was just looking to link up with any jihadist group. So what that indicates is that the squabbling between the leadership of al-Qaeda and ISIS that we see on the, in the newspapers doesn't necessarily trickle down to the membership. And so that's a dangerous trend. Ryan, I still don't understand how he got busted. Was it a matter of uh, observation, infiltration? Did they use undercover operators to find out uh, what these guys were doing? How specifically did he get busted? It looked like the indications were from uh, the indictment that they had some type of source overseas um, and that they were keeping track of him while he was over in Syria. So uh, that could be through electronic communication or it could be through a human source, uh, but it seems like they had pretty good tabs on him. Um, and so they waited for him to come into the United States so that they could arrest him. Um, one other very interesting thing here is that ISIS supporters believe that they are theologically mandated to first move to the caliphate before they do anything. That's why you've seen relatively few attacks here. A lot of al-Qaeda supporters believe essentially the same thing, that Syria is the first front because that qualifies as what's called the near jihad. Um, so to have someone that goes over there actually become dispatched to come back to the United States, uh, a lot of people will say, well, of course that would happen. It's actually quite significant. Well, it is significant, and it sets up a pattern that we addressed earlier this morning with Senator Chuck Grassley. As you gentlemen know, he chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee. He was saying, look, we need to get this solved. He, he pledged right here on the air to do everything he can to enact legislation barring these citizens or residents of the United States from going there and then trying to come back here to the country. Is that the best course of action, Ryan, legislatively to step in and strip them of citizenship or impose other penalties? It helps because it minimizes the chances that they'll be able to sneak back in. But in order to strip someone's citizenship like that, you have to have intelligence on them that they've actually joined ISIS or gone to an overseas training camp. And if you have that intelligence, then presumably you'd be able to arrest them and prosecute them when they come back in anyway. So I don't know that that's necessarily a game changer. What I do think we have a severe problem with is messaging. Uh, ISIS puts out these very powerful videos that we all know and, and that we've seen. Uh, well, where are our videos? Uh, when they lose territory in Tikrit, where are our powerful videos that are being distributed across the Arabic social media networks? Where's our counter narrative besides pointing to Muslim clerics, often ones who support Hamas and have their own radical backgrounds, who say we don't like ISIS? Because if we're going to defeat their recruitment and their ideology, it's got to go beyond just uplifting anybody who says, you know what, we condemn what ISIS does. Uh, the premise here that needs to be attacked is the idea that there has to be an Islamic State and that there is a caliphate that needs to be rebuilt and all the various anti-American narratives that go unchallenged in that region. Ryan, how comfortable should we feel that, uh, that the authorities are on top of people like this guy uh, if a relative had not gone overseas, had not attempted to go to, to Syria and train? What would have happened then? We've gotten lucky. Um, and part of that luck is also in the brutal honesty and the habit of ISIS and Al-Qaeda supporters uh, to just run their mouths. Uh, one of the things that's really amazing 
is how many times these individuals are on Facebook or on Twitter just openly saying what they intend to do, and then how many civilians will presumably see that on their Facebook news feed or whatever, and then don't report it. Uh, so we need to have citizens more actively engaged because I see this time and time again where someone gets arrested and people just logically had to have known about it. His colleagues, his circle of friends, people who even knew him years ago and were friends with him on Facebook and didn't report it. Um, so that's something we need to take advantage of. Bottom line is check your Facebook page as you call for citizens' involvement, Ryan Morrow. And uh, citizens certainly are concerned about a story that came out earlier this week from Judicial Watch. You've probably seen it, a report that there is an ISIS camp less than eight miles. It's in Mexico, less than eight miles from our southern border. What do you know about the presence of ISIS so close to the United States? I certainly can't confirm it, although it would be logical. Uh, generally, when we see these type of international networks involving ISIS, it's really small numbers of people. So I, I, it would be a little bit odd for there to be an actual training camp, but look, it's possible. When you look at what officials are saying in responding to this report, they're saying it's unverified, um, which in the vocabulary of Washington, D.C. officials and the intelligence community, it just means that they don't have solid proof yet. But that doesn't mean that the report is untrue or that there isn't substance behind it. Um, so if it was just completely made up, then you would have officials out there saying, look, there's just nothing to it. But instead, all they're saying is, is that this is unverified. And it's a pretty specific report. Um, it, it wasn't very vague, um, which I think gives it some credibility. Ryan, pretty quickly, both the United States and Mexico, as you pointed out, uh, refused to verify this. In fact, Judicial Watch said that they denied it. Uh, are they denying it because they don't want the population in Mexico or our country to get, uh, to get uh, scared? Or are they denying it because they fear people will accuse them of incompetence? The report I saw said that they just call it unverified, which is maybe they're denying it now, but the ones that I saw were some officials just saying it was unverified, um, which would be a way of not causing panic, but also not wanting to go against the truth if there actually is substance behind this. Um, th there's various reasons they'd want to downplay this report, whether it's because of source recruitment, you have a source reporting on it that you don't want to put in danger, you don't want to cause panic. Um, but I would be surprised that if there was solid information that an ISIS camp existed in Mexico, uh, that we would wait long to take it out. Well, it's very interesting. Next hour, Chris Farrell of Judicial Watch will join us. Now, this is interesting. When you talk about uh, the response being unverified, apparently there was a meeting in Mexico, Ciudad Juarez, involving our FBI and Mexican officials. And it seems the subject of the meeting was a press response to the Judicial Watch story, the clear implication being there was less concern about the possible presence of ISIS than it was in trying to formulate a story. We'll let Chris Farrell speak for Judicial Watch. Uh, in the interim, Ryan Morrow, we always appreciate your updates on ISIS, both abroad and more chillingly, what may be happening here at home. Now, a very important note, pay attention to this, America's Forum will air next week only starting at 11 a.m. Eastern. That's 8 a.m. in the West for Larry Elder. Remember that, next week only. That's when you'll see America's Forum, 11 in the East and 8 in the West. You see our lineup for next week right there. Some other changes coming to the schedule, we'll tell you about those soon. And America's Forum comes back after this. <music>